Proverbs chapter 23 is where we're going to be this morning and for two or three weeks probably, so you might just want to leave a bookmark in Proverbs 23. Uh, I've included the notes or the, the verses in your notes, and so if you're following along with a paper copy or you're following along on the screen, uh, you'll have the scriptures that go along with what we're going to talk about today. This is one of those chapters in Proverbs where Solomon talks about all kinds of stuff. Uh, probably in the copy of the Bible that you have, the chapter is divided into sayings. You know, saying one, saying two. I don't know who divided them into those sayings. Uh, I doubt that Solomon did. But it's just kind of the, the people that were translating it. It's their way of saying, okay, he's talking about something else now. And okay, he's talking about something else now. Because this is one of those chapters where he deals with several significant topics. Now, we're not going to look at all of them. We're not going to look at all of the different verses. But what we're going to do is just take a walk through this chapter. And we're going to look at some of the main themes that Solomon deals with. And uh, again, it's going to be at least two weeks, maybe three weeks. I don't know for sure yet. I appreciate your continued prayers about that. As we walk through Proverbs chapter 23. Look at verses 1, 2, and 3. When you sit to dine with the ruler, note well what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Now that's kind of a subtle way of putting it, isn't it? Here's what he's saying. Don't lose your self-control to wealth and position. Or another way, and aren't you glad I left the blank for the big word? Don't be enamored by wealth and position. E-N-A-M-O-R-E-D. <laughs> Don't be enamored by wealth and position. So here's what he said. Somebody who is wealthy and who has position, they have status in their society, and they have invited you to a feast. If you're not self-controlled, you're going to embarrass yourself, you know? and, and you're going to be so overwhelmed by this rich, well-known person has had me over to dinner that you're going to make a fool out of yourself if you don't control yourself. Now, the phrase, put a knife to your throat, is an idiom in the Hebrew language that means get a grip, you know? control yourself. He's not literally saying cut your throat, but what he's saying is don't get so wrapped up that you lose your self-control. Curb your appetite, control yourself, get a grip because that food is deceptive. In other words, that person that has invited you to this banquet has an agenda. And if you are so wrapped up in, look who I'm having lunch with, you're going to miss out on something because he's going to deceive you and you're going to end up in trouble. I think that's a pretty important principle, you know, to teach young people is be careful when, when somebody, you know, tries so hard to impress you, they probably want something from you. So keep your guard up, you know, listen to your spirit, pay attention to what's going on. And verses six through eight, he says the same thing. Do not eat the food, the NIV says, of a begrudging host. The King James says, don't eat the bread of him who has an evil eye. Now again, the evil eye was a Hebrew phrase that meant somebody who was selfish and only out for themselves and not out to do any good to you. So he says, be careful. Don't crave his delicacies. He's the kind of person who's always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. And then he says, once you find out what's really going on, you will vomit up the little you have eaten and you will have wasted your compliments. Now, if you're following along in the King James, you're confused right now because verse 7 in the King James says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And, and we know that verse. You know, we've got that verse basically memorized from hearing it so much. And that's true. We know that that's a principle. As you think in your heart, that's who you are. If you've been with us through this study of Proverbs, you know that we have probably over the last couple of years spent six or seven or eight weeks talking about your heart, your mind, how you think about things, 
your will, how you make decisions, your emotions, how you react to things, and how your heart sets the tone for your life. But Solomon uses a different word here for think. He's not talking about what you're meditating on. The word is actually the word to calculate or count the cost, which is why the NIV says he's the kind of person who's always thinking about the cost. What this verse is really saying is this. Here you are eating at this rich, well-connected person's table. And you think, he really likes me, and he's really trying to be nice to me. What you don't realize is he's got an agenda, and he's setting you up for something. And while he's doing that, and while you're stuffing your face, he's got a mental calculator running. And he's counting the cost of every bite you put in your mouth. You know? And he's adding up, this is how much you owe me now. So be careful. Don't be enamored by wealth and position. Don't let your guard down. Be careful. <laughs> All right? Now, in the middle of those verses, verse 4 and 5 gives us another insight into this. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Because, let's face it, when you're sitting down with somebody of position and wealth, there's something in your mind that says, boy, I wish I could be that. I wish I could do that. You know, especially for those of us who do not live the lifestyles of the rich and famous. You know, it's tempting when, when we're exposed to that. Say, oh, man, I need to do this. or I need to do that. So Solomon says, don't wear yourself out to get rich. Don't trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. It's kind of interesting that he puts those verses right in the middle of that parentheses of don't be enamored by some rich person who has position and status in society. Don't wear yourself out to get rich. Riches are fleeting, Solomon says. Don't focus on them. So what he's saying is when you stop and think, you realize, you know, here today, gone tomorrow can be very, very true. So don't focus on riches. I remember several years ago when, you know, when the market crashed that couple of days just, and I remember walking through the halls of, of the hospital and hearing people talk about, I just lost this much money. You know, I just lost everything I had in my account. You know, I mean, just the, the, the riches are fleeting. You know, you, you never know what to trust. Now, po Proverbs has an awful lot to say about money. And so since these first eight verses kind of set the stage, we're going to look at many other verses through the book of Proverbs this morning and look at some of the truths that Solomon teaches us about money and finances. Now, maybe you're set and you don't worry about money. Um, maybe you're not. But either way, there's truth in the scriptures about a perspective that we who trust God should have about our finances. And don't overlook number one, and that is there are benefits to money. All right, let's just be honest. There are benefits to money. Uh, Y'all remember the comic strip Garfield the cat? He was kind of my hero because he was snarky and sarcastic and he'd get by with it. But I remember seeing a poster of Garfield with that look on his face. And the poster said, I've been rich. I've been poor. Rich is better. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I understand that, right? So let's not be stupid. You know, please don't interpret the rest of this sermon to think that I don't think there's any benefits to money. There are benefits to money. And we're not honest if we don't recognize there are benefits to money. Money can make your life much easier. Uh, you have access to things if you have finances that you don't otherwise. There are benefits to money. Chapter 13 of Proverbs, verses 21 and 22. Trouble pursues the sinner, but the righteous are rewarded with good things. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Now he's saying you've got to have an inheritance that your grandchildren can get. Not just your children, but also your grandchildren. So it's okay to have money. You know, It's okay to, to save up. It's okay to have a retirement account. 
It's okay to have stuff put away. It's okay to be able to take care of your children and your grandchildren. There are benefits to that. So don't misinterpret the rest of the morning. There are benefits to having finances. Solomon never says money's wrong. The Bible never says money's wrong. You know that verse. The love of money is the root of all evil. What Solomon was talking about earlier in this chapter, that, that focusing on the finances is where you get into trouble. So there are benefits to money. Number two, however, having said there are benefits to money, don't make money your priority. Chapter 22, verse 1 says, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. So Solomon says, if you're going to make something your priority, make it your reputation, not how much money you've got. So let's kind of break that principle down. First, don't put your security in your finances. Don't put your security in your finances. Again, there's, it's wonderful if you are able to have a savings account, a retirement account. If you've got an inheritance to leave to your children and grandchildren, that's a blessing. But we've all lived long enough to know that it can be taken away, you know, in a day or two. So don't put your security in those finances. I think we're all intelligent enough to know the difference between having it and putting our security in it. I um, had a discussion with a wealthy businessman who was in one of my churches. And he said, you know, Pastor, he said, I really thought that I was trusting God and not my money. He said, because I know what it's like to make a million dollars in a year. He said, I've just recently learned what it's like to lose a million dollars in a year. And I did not like how I reacted to that. You know, he said, it kind of showed me that my faith and my security had kind of been in that money and not in the Lord. So don't put your security in your finances. Chapter 11, verse 28, he who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like the green leaf. <clears throat> and again, we just saw chapter 23, verses four and five. Don't wear yourself out to get rich, cast but a glance at riches and they're gone. So what we should prioritize is honest work. <laughs> That's not fun, is it? <laughs> we need to prioritize honest work. Chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Those who work their land will have an abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. A faithful person will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. So it's not just enough to have the land, you've got to work the land. And he said, don't just be chasing these fantasies, these get-rich-quick schemes. Work. Prioritize honest work. And then be a good manager of your finances. Chapter 25, verse 16. Interesting verse. If you, eat, if you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it, and you'll vomit. What he's saying is, Prosperity should not result in you over splurging on yourself. You know, have enough, but it shouldn't, you know, when you get a whole lot of extra money, that doesn't mean, oh, good, I'm going to go out and buy, you know, a Lamborghini. You know, he's saying, saying don't, said, when you find honey, eat enough to be satisfied. You know, it's okay to have a good car that's dependable, you know, but, but don't waste it on frivolous stuff. One of the most profound discussions I can remember having, one of the churches that I pastored, we had a, a Christian school. And one of the staff members of the school, a young lady, came up to me one day and she said, Pastor, I need you to pray for us. Because my husband is up for a big promotion. And with that promotion is going to come a big raise. And she said, I want you to pray for us that if this comes through, we won't forget to trust the Lord. Because she said, I'm afraid that if we make that much money, we might be trusting that instead of God. 
whoa, <laughs> I have never had somebody ask me that. Of course, I've never been in a position where that was a temptation, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, what he's saying is be a good manager. And if the Lord blesses you, again, it's okay to have nice things. It's okay to put things away for retirement and savings. And it's okay to treat yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. But he's saying, just don't make, don't eat so much you vomit. You know, don't, don't over splurge when God blesses you. All right. So don't make money your priority. And we talked about the benefits. Recognize that there are limitations and pitfalls of having money. Chapter 14, verse 20. The poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. Chapter 19, verse 4. Wealth attracts many friends. And can't you hear the uh, quotation marks around friends? You know, But even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. What he's saying is money attracts false friends. And maybe you had a time in your life where you were blessed financially, and it was amazing how many friends all of a sudden you had, right? You know, you read about the people who won the lottery and said, all of a sudden, people I never knew existed were my long lost cousin, you know. And, and so, you know, money attracts false friends. And money cannot save you from death and judgment. Proverbs 11.4, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. In other words, you can't bribe God. And you know that I work in healthcare through the week, and, and there are times when I run into people who have spent all of their health trying to get money, and now they're spending all of their money trying to get a little bit of health back. You know, it, it just, you, your money cannot save you. Now, it might delay it, you know, but it cannot save you from death or judgment. Your money will do you no good when you stand before God at judgment. And you say, well, Lord, how about if I give you this? You know, will you let me come into heaven? No, he said, money can't save you. It's worthless in the day of wrath. And we've already talked about this. Money is temporary. Chapter 27, verse 24, riches do not endure forever. And also, and we've all lived long enough to see this, money often leads to a downfall. Chapter 11, verse 28, those who trust in their riches will fall but the righteous will dry, thrive like a green leaf. A lot of times when people put their trust in money, they end up in a lot of trouble. You know, it's amazing. I, I should have brought the statistics. <coughs> but there's been a lot of um, news out in recent, a couple of recent years about athletes that sign multi-million dollar contracts and how many of them five years later are absolutely broke because they didn't know how to manage their finances and they bought three houses and six cars and, and they just, they didn't know how to manage their finances. They're broke. You know, the statistics on lottery winners who are just broke uh, and their life is much worse. And they say, I wish I'd have never won um, because money often leads to a downfall. And Solomon reminds us that there are things more important than money. Chapter 15, verses 16 and 17, better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. You know, if you've got love and you've got the fear of the Lord, you know, eating off the dollar menu is a whole lot more preferable than having a spread where there's stress and strife and turmoil. So, there are benefits to money. Don't make it your priority because there are limitations and pitfalls to it. And to help us navigate through this, seek wisdom first. Because wisdom will give you guidance in the area of your finances. And remember, wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. Chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Now, Proverbs chapter 8 is wisdom speaking. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. And then drop down to verses 18 and 19. With me, wisdom are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. 
in chapter 16, verse 16, how much better it is to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. Because if you have riches and no wisdom, they're going to ruin you. But if you have wisdom, it will help you know how to gain finances and to manage and appropriately use those finances. So seek wisdom first. Lord, let me know how you view this. Let me see your perspective on this. Teach me how I need to navigate the financial situation of my life. And then the overarching principle consistently through the scriptures, those who honor God with their money will be blessed. Chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. We studied this in great detail back on July the 31st, 2016. So if you want to dig out that sermon, uh, Mike can get it for you out of the archive, July 31, 2016. We dug into the, these verses in much more detail than I'm going to today. But the principle is there. Those who honor God with their finances will be blessed. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So let's define these words. Honor the Lord. It means put him first, glorify him, praise him, boast in the Lord, honor the Lord with your wealth. The King James says your substance. In other words, be aware of the fact that everything you have came from God. You know, yes, you worked, but who was it that gave you the ability to go work? You know, um, whether you work with your mind or you work with your body or however it is that you work, if that was gone from you and it could be gone from you in 30 seconds, then what would you do? It's God that gave us, the scripture says, it's God that gives you the ability to make money. Everything comes from him. So honor him with your wealth. Acknowledge that it's all his. And with the first fruits of your crops. You want to guess what first fruits means? Means first. <laughs> Doesn't mean leftovers. Means first. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your crops. All your crops. King James says, all your increase, you know, your gain, your profit. All right. Let's talk a little bit about first fruits because it starts way back in the Pentateuch. Leviticus chapter 23. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. And God said, Tell Moses, tell them this. Say to them that when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. And he's to wave it before the Lord so it'll be accepted on your behalf. In Deuteronomy, just as they're getting ready to go into the promised land, Moses reminds them of this and expands on it. I, 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 you just might want to read that whole section in Deuteronomy chapter 26. When you've entered the land, your Lord your God is giving you his inheritance and you've taken possession of it and settled in it. Take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you, put them in a basket, and basically he says, take them to the priest, and then declare what God has done for you. And you can read those intervening verses, and he gets down to verse 9. He brought us to this place, and he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me. And you place the basket before the Lord your God, you bow down before him. And then he says, you will rejoice in all the good things that the Lord has given you. So here's what he's saying. You're going into this land, you're going to reap a harvest. But it's because God did it for you. So you make sure that at harvest time, you take the first of what you harvest and take it to the Lord as an offering and say, this is is the first fruits of what the Lord has given me. It was a sign of their dependence on God. It was a sign of their appreciation to God. And it was a sign that everything they had was because of God. And so in Deuteronomy 14, when he talks about the tithe, he says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. And in Deuteronomy 14, 23, he tells us why. 
so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. The Living Bible says the purpose of the tithe is to teach us to put God first. That's what first fruits mean. And when we bring to God the first of what he has given us, it's an act of faith. It's a declaration that God is our provider and that everything we have comes from him. And so again, those verses we just looked at, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, you may not think your barn is overfilling, but uh, is your attic full? <laughs> is your storage shed full? Do you have to rent a storage facility? You know, is your closet about to break because there's so much stuff in it? You know, you know, our, our, we're pretty well overflowing, you know. Uh, you know, you, and, 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 you know, because we think, oh, well, but I don't drive a Lexus or whatever, you know. But, but our our barns are pretty well overflowing. You know, most people I know need more room, not less, for their stuff. And, and, and so what Solomon says is, through all of this, and this is what wisdom teaches you. Wisdom teaches you that if you put God first in your finances, it helps you keep perspective that it's all his and keeps your trust in him. And and I'm not going to preach on tithing this morning, but, you know, that's a scriptural principle. And some people ask, well, how can I afford to tithe? Because after I pay the light bill and pay for my groceries and pay all this, then I don't have anything left over to tithe. Well, again, remember the word first fruits does not mean what's left over. It means first. And somebody told me one time, and it's true, you will always be able to afford to tithe if that's the first check you write. And I have had many people come to me and say, you know, when I tithe, I can do more with what's left over than I ever could with my whole check. I'm not quite sure how that works. Well, I'm not quite sure how that works either, but it's God that's working it. I used to, I, I don't have them ready or I, I'm off, I would offer it to you today. But there have been some times in my ministry when I would actually enter into a guarantee, God's guarantee, that if you will agree that you know your first 10% of your income, you'll write a check to the church in six months. If you think that was a horrific mistake and I can document your giving, I will refund you. I have not had one person ask for a refund because it's God that says, if you put me first, I'll take care of you. When and, and you know, I don't. Those of us who have any influence over young children, uh, we used to have a tithe jar. Donna talks about that. And and when her parents died, she was kind of hoping she could find that tithe jar because it meant so much. It, it was it was a jar that you had somewhere in the house. And when you kids got an allowance, they knew that ten percent of that went into that tithe jar and went to church on Sunday. And so, like, if, you know, none of us, I don't think, ever got an allowance of $5, because back in the day, that would buy a car, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if they gave us $5, they would give us four ones and four quarters. Because 50 cents of that $5 went to God. And so we took those two quarters and put them in the tithe jar. Then it was ready for church. And it's a whole lot easier to tithe when you've done it, you know, from your allowance. Um, it's a whole lot harder to tithe when you make good money. You know? But if you understand the principle, you realize, well, maybe the reason I'm making good money is because I was faithful to God when I wasn't making good money. I heard about a guy that, I told you I wasn't going to preach on tithing, I'm just telling you stories now. But I, <laughs> but I, I heard about a guy that, you know, that he, he said, Pastor, he said, I just can't afford to tithe, man. I am making too much money and my tithe check is just too big. And the preacher said, well, we can take care of that. He said, dear Lord, I pray for my brother here. You know how hard he's having, you know, tithing on this big salary. Would you please cut his pay so he could afford to tithe? <laughs> no preacher, no preacher. So, <laughs> but one of the early names of financial expertise is John Templeton. 
And years ago, he was in Atlanta addressing an Economics Incorporated meeting. And he was talking about different economic theories. And somebody asked him, do you have any tips on the best investment that I could make? And he said, I sure do. I can give you a risk-free, guaranteed investment. I learned it 46 years ago from a book 2,000 years old. The first tenth of everything you have, return to your storehouse. And beyond that, make offerings as God prospers you. I guarantee you that will be the best investment you'll ever make. Honor God with your first fruits. Watch him take care of the rest. So if you get invited out to a banquet this week from some real rich, well-connected person, keep your guard up. <laughs> Pay attention. Enjoy the food, but don't make a fool of yourself. And, and let's ask God to give us wisdom, you know, as he blesses us with provision that we would know how to handle it, that we would know how to make wise investments and wise savings and be able to take care of our children and children's children but at the same time bring honor and glory to God by how we use what he's trusted us with. Father, this is a, a tough area in our society. Um, some of us are just barely making it, and, and we just need you to continue to be our provider. And others of us, Lord, maybe we just need to have our eyes opened again to how richly you have blessed us and to learn to be grateful for what you've given us. And Lord, help us to seek wisdom, your wisdom above everything else, and how to navigate the minefield that can be finances. Help us to study your word. Help us to be obedient to it. Help us to realize that every time we make an offering to you, whether we're doing it uh, on our computer at home or through the mail or here in this room, that whenever and however we're giving to you, we're acknowledging everything I have comes from you. Thank you, God, for providing for me and now I give to you with a heart of gratefulness and appreciation and thanksgiving and trust and faith that you're going to continue to take care of us. We thank you for that. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today.